Right, so my talk to some extent is going to be similar to the previous one given by Mark. So it touches the web from the philosophical lens. So let's jump into that directly. So I'm not gonna present every slice. I would want to touch the important points because my objective would be to give us sort of ideas for the future and the challenges we have right now. So, uh, so I wanna begin with the original vision of the web, which was laid out by the foundry itself, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, to provide an equal platform to all the humanity. But nowadays we are facing a lot of challenges, like uh, we have seen it, loss of control of personal data, misinformation, lack of transparency, which has caused division in the society. So it's really like a right time to ask this question, what really went wrong actually? So to answer this question, we need to look at a bit of fundamental, like from the historical lens, where the web which was laid out in 90s and the web we have now, how they are different, like uh, how it has affected the people and the relationship of the people among themselves. So to, to answer this question, uh, we can borrow some concepts from philosophy, like uh, Carl Mitchum, a famous philosopher, suggested three ways, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics to study relationship between technology and the philosophy. So here I consider web as some sort of technology. So to understand what went wrong, we can formulate like three questions, like from the metaphysics angle, like how the web over time changed the way people think about what it exists in the real life, as well as in the online life. Epistemology, epistemology is the science of knowledge creation. So what is the impact of web on it? And ethics and slash politics, how the web has affected how the people thinks they or the society should operate or they should live. So I would like to focus on these three fundamental questions and the impact of web over it. So jumping into the metaphysics part, so if you look at the 90s, like the very first iteration web 1.0, that was primarily where the content was contributed by a small number of users which had high technology literacy or some enterprises which has uh, technology. But uh, what was missing was like direct interaction between the content creators and audience. So over the time with web 2.0, uh, we had the rise of social media. That problem was solved. Now people were more invested in the web sort of more emotionally. And with the advanced, advancement in networking technology like 5G and 4G, we had the like computational infrastructures deployed uh, all over in the surrounding, as well as the internet of things. Now we have this new thing called web physical. And that's just basically the marriage of web and the networking technology. So which has enables this new kind of interaction mechanism or interaction technology like AR, VR. So, so the web 1.0 and 2.0, it had this concept of being and identity, but what was missing was the idea of like space and time, which seems to have been covered by this uh, advances in, in network infrastructure, like web physical. So uh, a little bit, I wanna focus on like identity and beings uh, in web 2.0. So with the complex network, we have created a, a network of information and knowledge about the user, but it has uh, created some issues. Like we have this data protection, privacy ownership issues. So in web 1.0, this wasn't really the issue, but web 2.0 with the community coming up in through the picture, people started sharing their information, their personal data. So it has created a bit of more problem. So, uh, but on the side note, we you just are more aware of what kind of data they are sharing with the other companies. Now with the epistemology, uh, the knowledge creation aspect. So here we have four elements, like what's be the ground truth of a knowledge formation the provenance, like the origin of the knowledge and justification and skepticism. So this one question is like, uh, when we use web, 
to create a knowledge was to be the ground truth and also how we would get users to agree on the ground truth. So uh, in the interview done by Sir Lee to Alpin and Morning, he mentioned that uh, like specification writers, whenever they propose a new word, they argue a lot, they do a lot of debate, but uh, in the web, as long as a lot of people agree that if the meaning of that new keyword are the same, then that itself becomes a knowledge. So there is a bit of push and pull between philosophical angle and the mass acceptance of that. And in terms of the implementation, uh, like the Wikipedia and the Stack Overflow could be too representative of a sort of web enabling knowledge creation where the ground truth was simply if a large number of users agree or a small number of experts, if they agree, then that is enough to be considered as a new knowledge. In recent years, blockchain has emerged. It is it's more likely to be, is a bit more stronger than what we had with the Wikipedia and Stack Overflow because it is going through the concession protocols. And uh, if your proposed block is accepted, there's also sort of financial incentive. And blockchain is has been considered as sort of next big thing for the internet and as well as for the web. Then the other question is comes, uh, what, what about the origin? How do we keep track of that? So in the original web 1.0, we had this URI and UDI that was the like unique identifier. Everything could be tracked through it. But the real concept like of the knowledge and the relevance. So in the web, we could have a lot of information, but the important thing is that we should be able to retrieve the relevant information. That begins when the search engine started to appear. So now the search engine has gone to the even next level. They not only use this unique identifier, they also use this uh, wisdom of crowd. Like for example, if the given web page is linked by uh, some other links which are highly trusted, then the, the score of that page is high. So web has gone, the search engine has gone to the next stage where they exploit wisdom of the crowd approach. Then also comes the question of justification. So now the enabling justification was missing in web 1.0 and web 2.0, where because they were primarily driven by the people with the semantic web, where the idea is that we should be able to embed the intelligence itself. Uh, it is still ongoing process, but we hope that uh, once when we have fully semantic web, we will have a, an intelligence embedded in the web itself, which would be able to do the justification itself. Then the last part, is the skepticism. A skepticism is basically either that is the absence of knowledge or there is not enough evidence to consider given piece of information to be a knowledge. So uh, the way Wikipedia has operated, we can consider this and comment as a representation of skepticism. So uh, 2018 Element Trust Barometer has, uh, they did some study and they have come up with this report that most of, majority of the people now, they are not even sure about the reliability of information they see. So definitely the people's skepticism has grown even more after the web has come into the picture. That is a bit of worrisome trend. The blockchain has been suggested as a white, white listing technique. Many government like Italian government, they have already started a project uh, where they are using blockchain to whitelist the news. So then there's one question comes, okay, so if the epistemology is not properly followed, what could really go wrong? So we can really look at two of the examples of US election 2016, that it can lead to like data capitalism, people could be caused to make a choices, which they think that they made an informed choice, but in reality, that could be coerced choice. And there was a recent report by EU Disinformation Lab about the Indian Chronicles report that had reported that how the Indian government has like targeted uh, misinformation from campaign against a particular entity in more than 65 countries. So the, what the point is, if epistemology is not followed properly in the web, we will have this data capitalism and misinformation on the scale never seen before 
and which was not even imagined in the original vision. Then that brings to the last element, like at the impact of web on the ethics. So in ethics, we can have considered like three elements like meta ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. So within meta ethics, we have these three elements like more semantics, more ontology, and more epistemology. So if you look at the from 90s, there has not been any major influence on the meaning of the moral terms, like the word good, bad, right, wrong. They, uh, the, the, the meaning is still remains the same. However, the, the association has been changed when it comes for the machine, for example, like for the people who are like uh, not good or bad, the people can understand the meaning, but for the machine, it is really hard to figure it out whether not good is it equal to bad. So if you want to embed more intelligence to the machine, uh, so that we can tackle misinformation campaign, we really need to have some sort of really unambiguous approach how to tackle this kind of issue. Then there's a last element of this paradox of legality and morality. So the laws in our democratic society, they're driven by the morals of the society itself. But the major issue with the legal system is that it moves really slow, but the morality of the society it uh, evolves really rapidly. So a lot of times we see that the court decisions, which are based on the law, they are not consistent with the current morals of the society. So it, it is a bit of a problem. And uh, recently Elon Musk uh, laid out his plan for the Twitter, where he proposes that the moderation should be limited only to the extent of what the laws permits only. But the problem is that that laws may not be consistent with the morals which we have in the society at this moment, because the laws has not been updated and any new amendment takes a lot of time. So the question is, is it good enough? His new propos proposition of this moderation to be limited to the laws, will it be Abhishek, good? Or will you, it be you've had your time and some. Are you wrapping up now? Oh yes, I think it's almost done. It's gotta be done because we've gone one o'clock. You can't go through that slide. Put it. Put your slides up. You can't talk talk through it. You haven't got time. Sorry. <laughs> um, can, we, can I mention this is the last one? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, like, uh, with the Facebook announcement and a lot of investment in the metaverse, we really need to st start looking into these aspects. Like, we need to start working on the philosophy of the metaverse. Like, in Avatar, should it be considered digital object or like? embodiment of the real beings and how should we even de ident like define multiverse and similarly uh, the metaverse will, will allow knowledge creation at the scale which was not possible before for example for a complex project like architecture it was quite difficult with the web but in with the metaverse we could do that so how should we do that how should we define ground truth for the metaverse and similarly like the for the politics part whether their legal liability for the virtual world, uh, how should we define it? Should it be the same as the one in the physical world or not? And not last, but not the, not the least, uh, how should we protect the vulnerable uses? Because the vulnerable uses are affected the most. So we really need to start protecting minor, like marginal uses as well. So that's something we really need to like think about it as a as the ecosystem I just started to begin. So that's, I wanted to talk about. And, 